the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter eleven part one for years dorian gray could not free himself from the influence of this book or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he never sought to free himself from it he procured from paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition and had them bound in different colours so that they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over which he seemed at times to have almost entirely lost control the hero the wonderful young parisian in whom the romantic and the scientific temperaments were so strangely blended became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself and indeed the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life written before he had lived it in one point he was more fortunate than the novel's fantastic hero he never knew never indeed had any cause to know that somewhat grotesque dread of mirrors and polished metal surfaces and still water which came upon the young parisian so early in his life and was occasioned by the sudden decay of a beauty that had once apparently been so remarkable it was with an almost cruel joy and perhaps in nearly every joy as certainly in every pleasure cruelty has its place that he used to read the latter part of the book with its really tragic if somewhat over-emphasised account of the sorrow and despair of one who had himself lost what in others and the world he had most dearly valued for the wonderful beauty that had so fascinated basil hallward and many others besides him seemed never to leave him even those who had heard the most evil things against him and from time to time strange rumours about his mode of life crept through london and became the chatter of the clubs could not believe anything to his dishonour when they saw him he had always the look of one who had kept himself unspotted from the world men who talked grossly became silent when dorian gray entered the room there was something in the purity of his face that rebuked them his mere presence seemed to recall to them the memory of the innocence that they had tarnished they wondered how one so charming and graceful as he was could have escaped the stain of an age that was at once sordid and sensual often on returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjecture among those who were his friends or thought that they were so he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room open the door with the key that never left him now and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that basil hallward had painted of him looking now at the evil and ageing face on the canvas and now at the fair young face that laughed back at him from the polished glass the very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken his sense of pleasure he grew more and more enamoured of his own beauty more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul he would examine with minute care and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight the hideous lines that seared the wrinkling forehead or crawled around the heavy sensual mouth wondering sometimes which were the more horrible the signs of sin or the signs of age he would place his white hands beside the coarse bloated hands of the picture and smile he mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs 
there were moments indeed at night when lying sleepless in his own delicately scented chamber or in the sordid room of the little ill-famed tavern near the docks which under an assumed name and in disguise it was his habit to frequent he would think of the ruin he had brought upon his soul with a pity that was all the more poignant because it was purely selfish but moments such as these were rare that curiosity about life which lord henry had first stirred in him as they sat together in the garden of their friend seemed to increase with gratification the more he knew the more he desired to know he had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them yet he was not really reckless at any rate in his relations to society once or twice every month during the winter and on each wednesday evening while the season lasted he would throw open to the world his beautiful house and have the most celebrated musicians of the day to charm his guests with the wonders of their art his little dinners in the settling of which lord henry always assisted him were noted as much for the careful selection and placing of those invited as for the exquisite taste shown in the decoration of the table with its subtle symphonic arrangements of exotic flowers and embroidered cloths and antique plate of gold and silver indeed there were many especially among the very young men who saw or fancied that they saw in dorian gray the true realization of a type of which they had often dreamed in eton or oxford days a type that was to combine something of the real culture of the scholar with all the grace and distinction and perfect manner of a citizen of the world to them he seemed to be of the company of those whom dante describes as having sought to make themselves perfect by the worship of beauty like gautier he was one for whom the visible world existed and certainly to him life itself was the first the greatest of the arts and for it all the other arts seem to be but a preparation fashion by which what is really fantastic becomes for a moment universal and dandyism which in its own way is an attempt to assert the absolute modernity of beauty had of course their fascination for him his mode of dressing and the particular styles that from time to time he affected had their marked influence on the young exquisites of the mayfair balls and pall mall club windows who copied him in everything that he did and tried to reproduce the accidental charm of his graceful though to him only half serious fopperies for while he was but too ready to accept the position that was almost immediately offered to him on his coming of age and found indeed a subtle pleasure in the thought that he might really become to the london of his own day what to imperial neronian rome the author of the satyricon once had been yet in his inmost heart he desired to be something more than a mere arbiter elegantiarum to be consulted on the wearing of a jewel or the knotting of a necktie or the conduct of a cane he sought to elaborate some new scheme of life that would have its reasoned philosophy and its ordered principles and find in the spiritualizing of the senses its highest realization the worship of the senses has often and with much justice been decried men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence 
but it appeared to dorian gray that the true nature of the senses had never been understood and that they had remained savage and animal merely because the world had tried to starve them into submission or to kill them by pain instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic as he looked back upon man moving through history he was haunted by a feeling of loss so much had been surrendered and to such little purpose there had been mad wilful rejections monstrous forms of self-torture and self-denial whose origin was fear and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancied degradation from which in their ignorance they had sought to escape nature in her wonderful irony driving out the anchorite to feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions yes there was to be as lord henry had prophesied a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh uncomely puritanism that is having in our own day its curious revival it was to have its service of the intellect certainly yet it was never to accept any theory or system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience its aim indeed was to be experience itself and not the fruits of experience sweet or bitter as they might be of the asceticism that deadens the senses as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them it was to know nothing but it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of a life that is itself but a moment there are few of us who have not sometimes wakened before dawn either after one of those dreamless nights that make us almost enamoured of death or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself and instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques and that lends to gothic art its enduring vitality this art being one might fancy especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of reverie gradually white fingers creep through the curtains and they appear to tremble in black fantastic shapes dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there outside there is the stirring of birds among the leaves or the sound of men going forth to their work or the sigh and sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house as though it feared to wake the sleepers and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave veil after veil of thin dusky gauze is lifted and by degrees the forms and colours of things are restored to them and we watch the dawn remaking the world in its antique pattern the wan mirrors get back their mimic life the flameless tapers stand where we had left them and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying or the wired flower that we had worn at the ball or the letter that we had been afraid to read or that we had read too often nothing seems to us changed out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known we have to resume it where we had left off and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necessity for the continuance of energy in the same wearisome round of stereotyped habits 
or a wild longing it may be that our eyelids might open some morning upon a world that had been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colours and be changed or have other secrets a world in which the past would have little or no place or survive at any rate in no conscious form of obligation or regret the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness and the memories of pleasure their pain it was the creation of such worlds as these that seemed to dorian gray to be the true object or amongst the true objects of life and in his search for sensations that would be at once new and delightful and possess that element of strangeness that is so essential to romance he would often adopt certain modes of thought that he knew to be really alien to his nature abandon himself to their subtle influences and then having as it were caught their colour and satisfied his intellectual curiosity leave them with that curious indifference that is not incompatible with a real ardour of temperament and that indeed according to certain modern psychologists is often a condition of it it was rumoured of him once that he was about to join the roman catholic communion and certainly the roman ritual had always a great attraction for him the daily sacrifice more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world stirred him as much by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of its elements and the eternal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolise he loved to kneel down on the cold marble pavement and watch the priest in his stiff flowered dalmatic slowly and with white hands moving aside the veil of the tabernacle or raising aloft the jewelled lantern-shaped monstrance with that pallid wafer that at times one would fain think is indeed the panis celestis the bread of angels or robed in the garments of the passion of christ breaking the host into the chalice and smiting his breast for his sins the fuming censers that the grave boys in their lace and scarlet tossed into the air like great gilt flowers had their subtle fascination for him as he passed out he used to look with wonder at the black confessionals and long to sit in the dim shadow of one of them and listen to men and women whispering through the worn grating the true story of their lives but he never fell into the error of arresting his intellectual development by any formal acceptance of creed or system or of mistaking for a house in which to live an inn that is but suitable for the sojourn of a night or for a few hours of a night in which there are no stars and the moon is in travail mysticism with its marvellous power of making common things strange to us and the subtle antinomianism that always seems to accompany it moved him for a season and for a season he inclined to the materialistic doctrines of the darwinismus movement in germany and found a curious pleasure in tracing the thoughts and passions of men to some pearly cell in the brain or some white nerve in the body delighting in the conception of the absolute dependence of the spirit on certain physical conditions morbid or healthy normal or diseased yet as has been said of him before no theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself he felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual speculation is when separated from action and experiment he knew that the senses no less than the soul 
have their spiritual mysteries to reveal and so he would now study perfumes and the secrets of their manufacture distilling heavily scented oils and burning odorous gums from the east he saw that there was no mood of the mind that had not its counterpart in the sensuous life and set himself to discover their true relations wondering what there was in frankincense that made one mystical and in ambergris that stirred one's passions and in violets that woke the memory of dead romances and in musk that troubled the brain and in champak that stained the imagination and seeking often to elaborate a real psychology of perfumes and to estimate the several influences of sweet-smelling roots and scented pollen-laden flowers of aromatic balms and of dark and fragrant woods of spikenard that sickens of hovenia that makes men mad and of aloes that are said to be able to expel melancholy from the soul at another time he devoted himself entirely to music and in a long latticed room with a vermilion and gold ceiling and walls of olive green lacquer he used to give curious concerts in which mad gypsies tore wild music from little zithers or grave yellow shawled tunisians plucked at the strained strings of monstrous lutes while grinning negroes beat monotonously upon copper drums and crouching upon scarlet mats slim turbaned indians blew through long pipes of reed or brass and charmed or feigned to charm great hooded snakes and horrible horned adders the harsh intervals and shrill discords of barbaric music stirred him at times when schubert's grace and chopin's beautiful sorrows and the mighty harmonies of beethoven himself fell unheeded on his ear he collected together from all parts of the world the strangest instruments that could be found either in the tombs of dead nations or among the few savage tribes that have survived contact with western civilizations and loved to touch and try them he had the mysterious juru paris of the rio negro indians that women are not allowed to look at and that even youths may not see till they have been subjected to fasting and scourging and the earthen jars of the peruvians that have the shrill cries of birds and flutes of human bones such as alfonso de ovalle heard in chile and the sonorous green jaspers that are found near cuzco and give forth a note of singular sweetness he had painted gourds filled with pebbles that rattled when they were shaken the long clarin of the mexicans into which the performer does not blow but through which he inhales the air the harsh touré of the amazon tribes that is sounded by the sentinels who sit all day long in high trees and can be heard it is said at a distance of three leagues the teponastli that has two vibrating tongues of wood and is beaten with sticks that are smeared with an elastic gum obtained from the milky juice of plants the yotl bells of the aztecs that are hung in clusters like grapes and a huge cylindrical drum covered with the skins of great serpents like the one that bernal diaz saw when he went with cortes into the mexican temple and of whose doleful sound he has left us so vivid a description the fantastic character of these instruments fascinated him and he felt a curious delight in the thought that art like nature has her monsters things of bestial shape and with hideous voices 
yet after some time he wearied of them and would sit in his box at the opera either alone or with lord henry listening in rapt pleasure to tannhauser and seeing in the prelude to that great work of art a presentation of the tragedy of his own soul on one occasion he took up the study of jewels and appeared at a costume ball as anne de joyeuse admiral of france in a dress covered with five hundred and sixty pearls this taste enthralled him for years and indeed may be said never to have left him he would often spend a whole day settling and resettling in their cases the various stones that he had collected such as the olive-green chrysoberyl that turns red by lamplight the cymophane with its wire-like line of silver the pistachio-coloured perido rose-pink and wine-yellow topazes carbuncles of fiery scarlet with tremulous four-rayed stars flame-red cinnamon stones orange and violet spinels and amethysts with their alternate layers of ruby and sapphire he loved the red gold of the sunstone and the moonstone's pearly whiteness and the broken rainbow of the milky opal he procured from amsterdam three emeralds of extraordinary size and richness of colour and had a turquoise de la vieille roche that was the envy of all the connoisseurs he discovered wonderful stories also about jewels in alfonso's clericalis disciplina a serpent was mentioned with eyes of real jacinth and in the romantic history of alexander the conqueror of emathia was said to have found in the vale of jordan snakes with collars of real emeralds growing on their backs there was a gem in the brain of the dragon philostratus told us and by the exhibition of golden letters and a scarlet robe the monster could be thrown into a magical sleep and slain according to the great alchemist pierre de boniface the diamond rendered a man invisible and the agate of india made him eloquent the cornelian appeased anger and the hyacinth provoked sleep and the amethyst drove away the fumes of wine the garnet cast out demons and the hydropicus deprived the moon of her colour the selenite waxed and waned with the moon and the melosius that discovers thieves could be affected only by the blood of kids leonardus camillus had seen a white stone taken from the brain of a newly killed toad that was a certain antidote against poison the bezoar that was found in the heart of the arabian deer was a charm that could cure the plague in the nests of arabian birds was the aspilates that according to democritus kept the wearer from any danger by fire the king of ceylon rode through his city with a large ruby in his hand at the ceremony of his coronation the gates of the palace of john the priest were made of sardius with the horn of the horned snake inwrought so that no man might bring poison within over the gable were two golden apples in which were two carbuncles so that the gold might shine by day and the carbuncles by night in lodge's strange romance a marguerite of america it was stated that in the chamber of the queen one could behold all the chaste ladies of the world in chased out of silver looking through fair mirrors of chrysolites carbuncles sapphires and green emeralds marco polo had seen the inhabitants of zipangu place rose-coloured pearls in the mouths of the dead a sea monster had been enamoured of the pearl that the diver brought to king peroses 
and had slain the thief and mourned for seven moons over its loss when the huns lured the king into the great pit he flung it away procopius tells the story nor was it ever found again though the emperor anastasius offered five hundred weight of gold pieces for it the king of malabar had shown to a certain venetian a rosary of three hundred and four pearls one for every god that he worshipped when the duc de valentinois son of alexander the sixth visited louis the twelfth of france his horse was loaded with gold leaves according to brantome and his cap had double rows of rubies that threw out a great light charles of england had ridden in stirrups hung with four hundred and twenty-one diamonds richard the second had a coat valued at thirty thousand marks which was covered with ballas rubies hall described henry the eighth on his way to the tower previous to his coronation as wearing a jacket of raised gold the placard embroidered with diamonds and other rich stones and a great borderick about his neck of large ballasses the favourites of james i wore earrings of emerald set in gold filigrane edward the second gave to piers gaveston a suit of red gold armour studded with jacinths a collar of gold roses set with turquoise stones and a skull-cap parsemé with pearls henry the second wore jewelled gloves reaching to the elbow and had a hawk glove sewn with twelve rubies and fifty-two great orients the ducal hat of charles the rash the last duke of burgundy of his race was hung with pear-shaped pearls and studded with sapphires how exquisite life had once been how gorgeous in its pomp and decoration even to read of the luxury of the dead was wonderful then he turned his attention to embroideries and to the tapestries that performed the office of frescoes in the chill rooms of the northern nations of europe as he investigated the subject and he always had an extraordinary faculty of becoming absolutely absorbed for the moment in whatever he took up he was almost saddened by the reflection of the ruin that time brought on beautiful and wonderful things he at any rate had escaped that summer followed summer and the yellow jonquils bloomed and died many times and nights of horror repeated the story of their shame but he was unchanged no winter marred his face or stained his flower-like bloom how different it was with material things where had they passed to where was the great crocus-coloured robe on which the gods fought against the giants that had been worked by brown girls for the pleasure of athena where the huge valerium that nero had stretched across the Colosseum at rome that titan sail of purple on which was represented the starry sky and apollo driving a chariot drawn by white gilt-reined steeds he longed to see the curious table napkins wrought for the priest of the sun on which were displayed all the dainties and viands that could be wanted for a feast the mortuary cloth of king chilperic with its three hundred golden bees the fantastic robes that excited the indignation of the bishop of pontus and were figured with lions panthers bears dogs forests rocks hunters all in fact that a painter can copy from nature and the coat that charles of orleans once wore 
on the sleeves of which were embroidered the verses of a song beginning madame je suis tout joyeux the musical accompaniment of the words being wrought in gold thread and each note of square shape in those days formed with four pearls he read of the room that was prepared at the palace at rheims for the use of queen joan of burgundy and was decorated with thirteen hundred and twenty-one parrots made in broidery and blazoned with the king's arms and five hundred and sixty-one butterflies whose wings were similarly ornamented with the arms of the queen the whole worked in gold catherine de medicis had a mourning bed made for her of black velvet powdered with crescents and suns its curtains were of damask with leafy wreaths and garlands figured upon a gold and silver ground and fringed along the edges with broideries of pearls and it stood in a room hung with rows of the queen's devices in cut black velvet upon cloth of silver louis the fourteenth had gold embroidered caryatids fifteen feet high in his apartment the state bed of sobieski king of poland was made of smyrna gold brocade embroidered in turquoises with verses from the koran its supports were of silver gilt beautifully chased and profusely set with enamelled and jewelled medallions it had been taken from the turkish camp before vienna and the standard of mohammed had stood beneath the tremulous gilt of its canopy and so for a whole year he sought to accumulate the most exquisite specimens that he could find of textile and embroidered work getting the dainty delhi muslins finely wrought with gold thread palmates and stitched over with iridescent beetles wings the dhaka gauzes that from their transparency are known in the east as woven air and running water and evening dew strange figured cloths from java elaborate yellow chinese hangings books bound in tawny satins or fair blue silks and wrought with fleur-de-lis birds and images veils of lassie worked in hungary point sicilian brocades and stiff spanish velvets georgian work with its gilt coins and japanese fukusas with their green-toned golds and their marvellously plumaged birds he had a special passion also for ecclesiastical vestments as indeed he had for everything connected with the service of the church in the long cedar chests that lined the west gallery of his house he had stored away many rare and beautiful specimens of what is really the raiment of the bride of christ who must wear purple and jewels and fine linen that she may hide the pallid macerated body that is worn by the suffering that she seeks for and wounded by self-inflicted pain he possessed a gorgeous cope of crimson silk and gold thread damask figured with a repeating pattern of golden pomegranates set in six-petalled formal blossoms beyond which on either side was the pineapple device wrought in seed pearls the orphreys were divided into panels representing scenes from the life of the virgin and the coronation of the virgin was figured in coloured silks upon the hood this was italian work of the fifteenth century another cope was of green velvet embroidered with heart-shaped groups of acanthus leaves from which spread long-stemmed white blossoms the details of which were picked out with silver thread and coloured crystals the morse bore a seraph's head in gold thread raised work the orphreys were woven in a diaper of red and gold silk and were starred with medallions of many saints and martyrs 
among whom was saint sebastian he had chasubles also of amber-coloured silk and blue silk and gold brocade and yellow silk damask and cloth of gold figured with representations of the passion and crucifixion of christ and embroidered with lions and peacocks and other emblems dalmatics of white satin and pink silk damask decorated with tulips and dolphins and fleur-de-lis altar frontals of crimson velvet and blue linen and many corporals chalice veils and suderia in the mystic offices to which such things were put there was something that quickened his imagination for these treasures and everything that he collected in his lovely house were to be to him means of forgetfulness modes by which he could escape for a season from the fear that seemed to him at times to be almost too great to be borne upon the walls of the lonely locked room where he had spent so much of his boyhood he had hung with his own hands the terrible portrait whose changing features showed him the real degradation of his life and in front of it had draped the purple and gold pall as a curtain for weeks he would not go there would forget the hideous painted thing and get back his light heart his wonderful joyousness his passionate absorption in mere existence then suddenly some night he would creep out of the house go down to dreadful places near bluegate fields and stay there day after day until he was driven away on his return he would sit in front of the picture sometimes loathing it and himself but filled at other times with that pride of individualism that is half the fascination of sin and smiling with secret pleasure at the misshapen shadow that had to bear the burden that should have been his own after a few years he could not endure to be long out of england and gave up the villa that he had shared at trouville with lord henry as well as the little white walled-in house at algiers where they had more than once spent the winter he hated to be separated from the picture that was such a part of his life and was also afraid that during his absence some one might gain access to the room in spite of the elaborate bars that he had caused to be placed upon the door he was quite conscious that this would tell them nothing it was true that the portrait still preserved under all the foulness and ugliness of the face its marked likeness to himself but what could they learn from that he would laugh at any one who tried to taunt him he had not painted it what was it to him how vile and full of shame it looked even if he told them would they believe it yet he was afraid sometimes when he was down at his great house in nottinghamshire entertaining the fashionable young men of his own rank who were his chief companions and astounding the county by the wanton luxury and gorgeous splendour of his mode of life he would suddenly leave his guests and rush back to town to see that the door had not been tampered with and that the picture was still there what if it should be stolen the mere thought made him cold with horror surely the world would know his secret then perhaps the world already suspected it for while he fascinated many there were not a few who distrusted him he was very nearly blackballed at a west end club of which his birth and social position fully entitled him to become a member and it was said that on one occasion when he was brought by a friend into the smoking-room of the churchill the duke of berwick and another gentleman got up in a marked manner and went out 
curious stories became current about him after he had passed his twenty-fifth year it was rumoured that he had been seen brawling with foreign sailors in a low den in the distant parts of whitechapel and that he consorted with thieves and coiners and knew the mysteries of their trade his extraordinary absences became notorious and when he used to reappear again in society men would whisper to each other in corners or pass him with a sneer or look at him with cold searching eyes as though they were determined to discover his secret of such insolences and attempted slights he of course took no notice and in the opinion of most people his frank debonair manner his charming boyish smile and the infinite grace of that wonderful youth that seemed never to leave him were in themselves a sufficient answer to the calumnies for so they termed them that were circulated about him it was remarked however that some of those who had been most intimate with him appeared after a time to shun him women who had wildly adored him and for his sake had braved all social censure and set convention at defiance were seen to grow pallid with shame or horror if dorian gray entered the room yet these whispered scandals only increased in the eyes of many his strange and dangerous charm his great wealth was a certain element of security society civilized society at least is never very ready to believe anything to the detriment of those who are both rich and fascinating it feels instinctively that manners are of more importance than morals and in its opinion the highest respectability is of much less value than the possession of a good chef and after all it is a very poor consolation to be told that the man who has given one a bad dinner or poor wine is irreproachable in his private life even the cardinal virtues cannot atone for half-cold entrees as lord henry remarked once in a discussion on the subject and there is possibly a good deal to be said for his view for the canons of good society are or should be the same as the canons of art form is absolutely essential to it it should have the dignity of a ceremony as well as its unreality and should combine the insincere character of a romantic play with the wit and beauty that make such plays delightful to us is insincerity such a terrible thing i think not it is merely a method by which we can multiply our personalities such at any rate was dorian gray's opinion he used to wonder at the shallow psychology of those who conceive the ego in man as a thing simple permanent reliable and of one essence to him man was a being with myriad lives and myriad sensations a complex multiform creature that bore within itself strange legacies of thought and passion and whose very flesh was tainted with the monstrous maladies of the dead he loved to stroll through the gaunt cold picture gallery of his country house and look at the various portraits of those whose blood flowed in his veins here was philip harbert described by francis osborne in his memoirs on the reigns of queen elizabeth and king james as one who was caressed by the court for his handsome face which kept him not long company was it young harbert's life that he sometimes led had some strange poisonous germ crept from body to body till it had reached his own 
was it some dim sense of that ruined grace that had made him so suddenly and almost without cause give utterance in basil hallward's studio to the mad prayer that had so changed his life here in gold-embroidered red doublet jewelled surcoat and gilt-edged ruff and wristbands stood sir anthony sherard with his silver and black armour piled at his feet what had this man's legacy been had the lover of giovanna of naples bequeathed him some inheritance of sin and shame were his own actions merely the dreams that the dead man had not dared to realise here from the fading canvas smiled lady elizabeth Deverer in her gauze hood pearl stomacher and pink slashed sleeves a flower was in her right hand and her left clasped an enamelled collar of white and damask roses on a table by her side lay a mandolin and an apple there were large green rosettes upon her little pointed shoes he knew her life and the strange stories that were told about her lovers had he something of her temperament in him these oval heavy-lidded eyes seemed to look curiously at him what of george willoughby with his powdered hair and fantastic patches how evil he looked the face was saturnine and swarthy and the sensual lips seemed to be twisted with disdain delicate lace ruffles fell over the lean yellow hands that were so overladen with rings he had been a macaroni of the eighteenth century and the friend in his youth of lord ferrers what of the second lord beckenham the companion of the prince regent in his wildest days and one of the witnesses at the secret marriage with mrs fitzherbert how proud and handsome he was with his chestnut curls and insolent pose what passions had he bequeathed the world had looked upon him as infamous he had led the orgies at carlton house the star of the garter glittered upon his breast beside him hung the portrait of his wife a pallid thin-lipped woman in black her blood also stirred within him how curious it all seemed and his mother with her lady hamilton face and her moist wine-dashed lips he knew what he had got from her he had got from her his beauty and his passion for the beauty of others she laughed at him in her loose bacante dress there were vine leaves in her hair the purple spilled from the cup she was holding the carnations of the painting had withered but the eyes were still wonderful in their depth and brilliancy of colour they seemed to follow him wherever he went yet one had ancestors in literature as well as in one's own race nearer perhaps in type and temperament many of them and certainly with an influence of which one was more absolutely conscious there were times when it appeared to dorian gray that the whole of history was merely the record of his own life not as he had lived it in act and circumstance but as his imagination had created it for him as it had been in his brain and in his passions he felt that he had known them all those strange terrible figures that had passed across the stage of the world and made sin so marvellous and evil so full of subtlety it seemed to him that in some mysterious way their lives had been his own the hero of the wonderful novel that had so influenced his life had himself known this curious fancy in the seventh chapter he tells how crowned with laurel lest lightning might strike him he had sat as tiberius in a garden at capri reading the shameful books of elephantis 
while dwarfs and peacocks strutted round him and the flute-player mocked the swinger of the censer and as caligula had caroused with the green-shirted jockeys in their stables and supped in an ivory manger with a jewel-frontleted horse and as domitian had wandered through a corridor lined with marble mirrors looking round with haggard eyes for the reflection of the dagger that was to end his days and sick with that ennui that terrible tidium vitae that comes on those to whom life denies nothing and had peered through a clear emerald at the red shambles of the circus and then in a litter of pearl and purple drawn by silver-shod mules been carried through the street of pomegranates to a house of gold and heard men cry on nero caesar as he passed by and as elagabalus had painted his face with colours and plied the distaff among the women and brought the moon from carthage and given her in mystic marriage to the sun over and over again dorian used to read this fantastic chapter and the two chapters immediately following in which as in some curious tapestries or cunningly wrought enamels were pictured the awful and beautiful forms of those whom vice and blood and weariness had made monstrous or mad filippo duke of milan who slew his wife and painted her lips with a scarlet poison that her lover might suck death from the dead thing he fondled pietro barbi the venetian known as paul the second who sought in his vanity to assume the title of formosus and whose tiara valued at two hundred thousand florins was bought at the price of a terrible sin gian maria visconti who used hounds to chase living men and whose murdered body was covered with roses by a harlot who had loved him the borgia on his white horse with fratricide riding beside him and his mantle stained with the blood of perotto pietro riario the young cardinal archbishop of florence child and minion of sixtus the fourth whose beauty was equalled only by his debauchery and who received leonora of aragon in a pavilion of white and crimson silk filled with nymphs and centaurs and gilded a boy that he might serve at the feast as ganymede or hylas etzeline whose melancholy could be cured only by the spectacle of death and who had a passion for red blood as other men have for red wine the son of the fiend as was reported and one who had cheated his father at dice when gambling with him for his own soul giambattista cibo who in mockery took the name of innocent and into whose torpid veins the blood of three lads was infused by a jewish doctor sigismondo malatesta the lover of isotta and the lord of rimini whose effigy was burned at rome as the enemy of god and man who strangled polysena with a napkin and gave poison to ginevra d'este in a cup of emerald and in honour of a shameful passion built a pagan church for christian worship charles the sixth who had so wildly adored his brother's wife that a leper had warned him of the insanity that was coming on him and who when his brain had sickened and grown strange could only be soothed by saracen cards painted with the images of love and death and madness and in his trimmed jerkin and jewelled cap and acanthus like curls grifonetto baglioni who slew astorre with his bride and simonetto with his page and whose comeliness was such that as he lay dying in the yellow piazza of perugia 
those who had hated him could not choose but weep and atalanta who had cursed him blessed him there was a horrible fascination in them all he saw them at night and they troubled his imagination in the day the renaissance knew of strange manners of poisoning poisoning by a helmet and a lighted torch by an embroidered glove and a jewelled fan by a gilded pomander and by an amber chain dorian gray had been poisoned by a book there were moments when he looked on evil simply as a mode through which he could realize his conception of the beautiful End of chapter 11